Welcome to What's in the Box, episodes of horror with Donna and Eric. I'm Donna. And I'm Eric. And today we're discussing the book The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz. I hope I said that name right. Um, so what'd you think? Um, it's a book. And, and was it your first time reading it? Sort of. Well, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it, I know I tried to read this a couple of years ago and I thought I'd given up, but apparently when I go to Goodreads, I'd already rated it. So I must've finished it at some point, but I don't remember getting past a certain point and I don't remember hating it as much as my rating. Re, you know, I gave it two stars the first time. Wow. Um, this time I wouldn't, I'd give it more than two. I thought it was good. I got to a certain point where I thought it was, you know, entertaining. I hated the ending. And uh, a couple of characters I didn't really care for, but overall it was it was well written, you know. Yeah, yeah. This was my first time reading it, um, and I actually really liked it. I thought this was I think this is in my top two of the books we've read. You know what? It may still be in the top two for me as well. I mean, it was there were moments where I thought this is great, um, and maybe it was just the surge to get it done in time for the recording. Maybe that's coloring me, you know, mm. but by the time I got to the end, I was, uh, I was happy to be done with it. So, uh, well, we can go through the different levels and kind of see where, where, yeah. where it lost me. Cause it did lose me a little bit. And I yeah. think it was one character. One character was driving me crazy throughout this entire process. Yeah. So as I was reading it, you know, when I got started, I was like, oh, here we go again. We got the asshole boyfriend. We've got the religion, and they're not religious, but now they are religious with Allison. Um, and I was like, oh, man, you know, this is definitely a theme for these 70s horror books. Um, yeah. But then it started to progress, and I was like, okay, I really like this. <laughs> like, I really enjoy this book. I thought it was on the cover of the one I had, but I must have seen it in an ad. But it like it lists like all of the books we've already read. Yeah. As first there was, you know, The Exorcist yeah. and Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, okay, nice. yeah, mine's falling out. The cat was going crazy. Uh, we haven't read the other. So maybe that's probably a good thing at this point. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely has vibes of the omen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it feels like we naturally built up to this. And I totally agree with you on the... Um, you know, they, they it felt like they said, here is the blueprint. We must mm -hmm. follow this blueprint. Now, they did put their own spin on it, I thought, but they yeah. really did. Um, so because of what we've read, as we're reading this book, I if I, at least I know I found myself slowly leaning one way or the other with each character thinking, mm -hmm. okay, well, this is going to be the betrayal of the husband or or not even the husband the boyfriend i guess at this point yeah or, you know the best friend is going to have this happen or you know we've got the quirky neighbors and uh, i was just like okay i can kind of get an idea where this is going and he did have some very cool twists and turns that that were a little different than what i was expecting yeah the yeah. character i couldn't stand was the detective I did oh, not Gats. like the cop. Yeah, the Gats. cop was so annoying. I mean, he was so stereotypical, yeah. 70s. He was every cop that we've already read amplified mm -hmm. by 100. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't know. I did. I like the character was kind of annoying, like you said, um, of Gats. Um, I just was confused because at the end, he says, oh, I was wrong about Michael Farmer. Right. Um, but he ended up having this evidence from about Michael Farmer that they really didn't go into too much. Right. Well, I think the, the point was is because Allison disappeared. Now she yeah. is the prime suspect and Michael's dead. Yeah. So, so he's got the person he thought committed all the murders. Now he's dead. And the person that he totally wasn't focusing on at all She's gone, and now the evidence points to her as being the reason why the original guy's wife might, might have been killed. Yeah. Um, so I think what I, this is what I didn't like about him. Every time he talked, he told you how nothing smelled, you know, I, what is it? I smell this, and this doesn't smell right. And I know 
even the facts are saying one thing, I know you're guilty and I'm not going to give up on this and I'm going to keep hounding you. He was overly aggressive with the, the people constantly with the character, mm -hmm. you know, and I get it if he thinks he's right, but that's not going to, you know, I, I guess it's because he was supposed to be like this. Oh, I don't know. The character was supposed to be kind of a. Uh, well, he wanted revenge because yeah, he, he wanted, was, I, yeah, I've been he was about, busted but, down in rank because of the the investigation of farmer's wife michael right but wife. instead of being like a, a good cop and, and following the information everything was always his gut and his anger and yeah the way he he re interacted with the characters it was so unbelievable yeah and i found every time he showed up i was taken out of the story and i in the other i thought the the boyfriend michael i thought he did the same thing to me constantly he would take me out of the story with the way he reacted to everything i was like mm -hmm. nobody reacts this way in a situation like i just was so you know balls to the wall crazy every time i thought yeah. it was like when we discussed amityville if that stuff was really going on you wouldn't be in that house anymore you know it's like they mm -hmm. they didn't they, they didn't react like we thought they should yeah i thought the story itself though the whole story the whole story arc was was entertaining and uh, interesting and it had some some good things to it yeah and i i don't know i kind of don't like the way like Maybe I guess it was intentional with the way it was Michael Ward's written, but you know, he's at first this asshole. He's like, You're gonna do what I say, and he's like gone when she gets back from wherever from her father's funeral. And um, but then all of a sudden he's like gung ho, I love her and I'm gonna protect her and I'm gonna figure out what's going on. Yeah, I, you know, and I think we, we're doing a disservice to the story itself because we've jumped right into it and we started talking about it just all over the place. So the idea of this book is that she goes home because her father has recently passed away or was dying. Was so she's dying. She's gone for months. She's months. gone for months. Yeah. Then she comes back to New York where she's had a relationship with this character, Michael, and um, she's given up her apartment. So he has her stay with him. And then she starts to look for her own place. And then the story is basically her getting her own place and then terrible things happening to us. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and you're right, because at the beginning, he's not even there to greet her after her being gone for four to five months. He's a lawyer. He's out of town doing something he said was important. But right there, because of all the other books we read, I immediately thought, okay, something's up. And yeah. then he comes back and he's cold and he's really not, like you said, he's not into her in the way that we would think after four months absence you know right um it's almost as if he could do without her you know and and, and then you kind of get that feeling that because she's a model that that this might be a relationship of just complete uh you know it's a, a trophy situation yeah right? where you're not even looking at that he doesn't care and and so she may be more invested in this than than he is but you can also tell that she's not invested in the relationship as much because she still hasn't told him anything about her past. She right. he doesn't he doesn't even know that at one point she was very religious, um, and she's Catholic, and she doesn't he doesn't know what happened with the family. Doesn't understand why she left um, Middle America. What was it, Indiana? I don't. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, it, was. it was somewhere yeah. right in the middle of this. You know, she's a country girl came to New York to be a model, which we've yeah. kind of seen with uh, Rosemary. We saw how she was a country girl in yep. new york not to be a model but she's kind of living that same lifestyle because the husband's an actor but right. yeah so yeah i'm with you right there so you i mean so he basically gave us a red herring mm -hmm. with that yeah and, and really then focused on the boyfriend for a good half of this book you thought the boyfriend exactly was um yeah and especially like um when she was having him over for dinner for the first time he mm -hmm. was like hours late first of all who eats dinner at 10 o'clock at night like, <laughs> I know. Well, you know what? I always wonder about New York. Yeah, because we kind of got the same vibe with Rosemary. Rosemary. Yeah, they, they were, were always, always having... doing stuff at weird hours, and you're like, yeah. But not only that, because he took her to remember later in the book, he takes her out to dinner. It's and midnight, they go, it's and they go midnight. to a wax museum at midnight. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, I get it. It's a city that never sleeps, but yeah, that's crazy. That that kind of was like tricked me out, and you know, I'm like. And then when the best friend has the party, it's like, oh, you know, 
11 o'clock at night and they're having a dinner party. <laughs> right, with 60 of their closest friends. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, I get that. You know, they're all models and photographers. But I also thought, wasn't it weird? Because we're talking the 70s. And this is, you know, this was written in the late 70s. I assume it takes place at about the same time yeah. as it's written. So we're talking a very decadent age. And she's a model in New York City. And she is the, the most um, easily offended person ever yep. written in literature you know in the 70s that feels like and she doesn't smoke which surprised me yeah because I was it a was a little surprised too it was very apparent like it was always made a, aware that she does not smoke She's like i don't smoke and same with michael you know i don't smoke. yeah and, and like and everybody a, smoked in the 70s right and they made a point <laughs> to make it seem like it was it stood out because every character that she said that to had a comment about that yeah which makes me wonder if maybe the writer himself doesn't smoke yeah you know maybe. and that's something i got that i a couple i told uh don when i when i was reading it i would like read sections to her and i said does this make any sense to you i said it's like this person's never met a woman or mm -hmm. that this person has never smoked a cigarette or had a cigarette or been around a cigarette i mean at one point he's got a thing where a lady walks to a bookshelf and picks up a burning cigarette and starts smoking yeah. And I assume, okay, maybe it's in an ashtray, but it just seemed like such a weird location, a weird act, you know what I mean? She didn't light it up. It's been sitting on, and she she picks it up at a point where she has been engaged with another human for probably 30 to 40 minutes. Yeah, and this was so, dirty, right, like, this, from the apartment. And so it was just, like, really, uh, no, I'm talking about when uh, Jennifer and Michael are talking about. Um, oh, okay. Okay. I mean, it's just a throwaway line, but it stood out to me because it seems so ridiculous that mm. nobody's just got a cigarette sitting on a bookcase burning for 40 <laughs> minutes and then picking it up and just going like no big deal. I mean, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. I know they were a little cavalier about things in the 70s, but they're not that cavalier. Yeah. And, and, and also, yeah, I was going to say another thing that kind of threw me off was um, after the wax museum, mm -hmm. he goes to like the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, to find out about the ad, and I'm like, what newspaper office is open? I have a feeling in New York they were open back then, 24 seven, because they're running the the editions. So oh, somebody yeah. had to be there, but I don't think all the offices would have been staffed. Like he called another office, the, he called the real estate. estate. Yeah, I don't yeah. think they would have been there, but I think this is a person who probably lived in New York, and so maybe they just like the Rosemary Baby book. You know, he, he lived in New York. He was a playwright. So he had this insight that we may not have known. But yeah, it sounded like they were on a completely different planet when mm -hmm. we were, when I was reading. And I would, every, so many things stood out. You know what? In fact, I took a picture. Every I started taking pictures of pages because I was like, you know what? That is crazy. <laughs> and I wanted to like, I want to revisit this section and that section. But so we have, we have Allison, who I thought was a, was an interesting character. I liked how he was really, it was like a, a faucet just turned to a trickle on information with her and it built up the um, the backstory and the reasons for everything she was having. I right. thought that was an interesting way of dealing with her. Um, there was a point of like, I want to say 10 chapters in, maybe 100 pages, something like that. And I was like, man, I am really digging this. This is really good. And so I did enjoy, I did enjoy the book. I just was kind of disappointed with the ending. Mm -hmm. And I would say about a, a hundred and twenty five, a hundred and fifty in, which in this book's like two, two seventy. Um, yeah. I was thinking, I, I was thinking I figured it out. You know, I thought she was in purgatory. I thought she was already dead because they kept mentioning the suicide stuff. I figured she's already dead. So this is what she's got to do. And then they'll just stick her over here to watch this. And this is, and it was close, but it wasn't exactly what it was going right. on. So, but I was like, and that was fine too. I don't mind figuring it out early uh, if it's, if it's still written well. And I thought all that was done, but then at the end it had that, it had that, I, you know, it, it was the energy from Michael that really pulls you out of the story, out of the ending. The way he, like you said, he went from, I don't care to, I'm going to do anything and everything to save this person. Right. With absolutely no restraint or logic to his motions. And I understood why he didn't want to deal with the cops. But when Jennifer suggests, maybe we should talk to the cops. And then she speaks his ex-wife's or his dead wife's name. 
his reaction is so over the top violent mm -hmm. that I was immediately taken aback that she, the lady, I was like, do they just, was everybody just used to getting smacked around in the seventies? Cause he yeah. just smacks everyone around in this movie or in yeah. this book. And I'm like, it just doesn't make any, it doesn't make sense. You know, I understood yeah. his desperation and all that stuff, but I didn't understand everyone else putting up with it. And I guess maybe that's just the a time, you know, a time yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed the, the Michael character, the, the twisting and turning of like, you start off, you're like, oh, he's in on it. Like um, Rosemary's husband there, you know, oh, he's in on it. Um, he's a bad person but then he changes right. and he's like oh no he's a good person and then like you find out that he actually did contract for his you know previous his wife's death and you're like oh he's a scumbag but he must be okay because he's trying to save allison you know? yeah and that doesn't yeah. that doesn't that make you wonder though why is he trying to save allison he's not married to her so he's not going to get the money so he he just right. proves the the guy's case the detective's case against him on the new one yeah. but uh but also he's accused of taking uh bribes and uh so and so he's accused of killing his his wife who they ruled a suicide but later at the very end and you know what i would have preferred that they didn't even mention that at the very end, when Michael's there and he and he tells her, makes the proclamation that he's there, he's in hell because of this, and now he's he's attached to Brownstone because of what he did to his ex-wife or his you know, past wife or whatever. I think it would have been better if he would have just said, "I'm here for my sins," and allowed us to infer right. from that that that's it. Um, and that would have made the ending with the detective a little stronger because then the detective's like, "Well, I, maybe I was wrong." And that leaves us thinking, well, maybe we were wrong or maybe he was right because we know he's in hell. The detective just thinks he's dead. Yeah. Um, and I also thought that was really weird too. How um, anti-religious Michael came across every time she did anything that was even remotely right. religious. It was like everything that we had discussed in all the other movies we've discussed that had anything to do with religion. There was that underlying theme that seemed to be prevalent in society. This anti-religion, this uh, is God dead philosophy. Right. And, it, and he really embodied that to the point where he was physically abusive about it, right. which I thought was really strange. And I was like, I don't understand why he cares so much that she cares about religion at this point in her life. I mean, she, after all that she's gone through. Um, you know, the fact that she reclaims the cross and wears it and, and finds some solace in something as simple as just having a cross angered him to the point where he was physically abusive about it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really strange. Um, yeah. Even when later she she admits she went to a church, she prays, she had the weight lift off of her. She felt better than she'd felt in a while. Um, you know, she'd given confession. And he, he even saw that it was having a positive effect on her. Even if he doesn't believe it, it's having a positive effect on her. Right. And yet he still was so angry about it. And I thought, this is such a weird reaction. And it made me want, it makes me want to dig deeper into Jeffrey's, you know, situation. Right. You know, and also at the time, I mean, it really does make me want to do a deep dive on religion in a spe specifically the East Coast in uh you know some of the larger cities in the 70s because man these books are really they're all beating the same the same uh -huh. drum beat you know yeah. so but anyways i thought that was just a weird if that every time it happened it stood out it's so weird which made me think he's in on it even more because it's right. so crazy but in the end you find out unlike all the other books it these it, the religion is the bad guy you know, it's not the Antichrist, it's not demon worshipers, it's not witchcraft or any of that stuff. It's actually the church doing this thing to set up the person to guard the gate so that demons can't, or what is it, the, yeah, the fallen angels can't get back to heaven? I think right. that's what, or is that yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. It's very complicated. Yeah. Um, but I felt like they rushed into it at the end. It was like, um, you know, here's 250 pages and, and then 25 pages, we're going to explain everything and just tell yep. it to you. We're just going to hand it to you. Yeah. And then we're going to do it in a way that's a little confusing and make you have to, you know, go <laughs> yeah. back and double check some stuff. And then we're going to totally, you know, so it, 
I guess in this, the way it ends makes you need to read the sequel, which was, you know, smart on his part. Mm -hmm. I was just disappointed that there was, you know, as I got to the end of the book and it all made sense um, in a way, but I was kind of disappointed that the priest was a a more prominent, I mean, 100%. he's, He's like the forefront of this cover, this creepy priest. And, you know, on the back, you know, it talks about this creepy priest. And um, so I'm like, I thought there would be more. And you just have that one scene where he's with Michael mm-hmm. um, in the last 20 something pages of the book, like you said. And then there's the scene with Finocchi or whatever, the the archbishop or. Yeah, the priest that's not a priest, priest but might be a priest and is also, the, you know, the, the landlord. The Oh, who's not but, who's not in a wheelchair but he was in a wheelchair right and but even more interesting uh he also would later go to miami and be a part of the uh, ci so was csi there it was david carusa yeah wasn't that the name of the character I, yes. I, as soon yeah. as i read it i thought oh, this is hilarious <laughs> i pictured the red hair and the sunglasses and him pausing all the time as he was talking but yeah, yeah, but yeah no, so i thought that was, was pretty fun there was only two two scenes with the priest yeah, he um, should have been way more prevalent. Yeah, and I get it. He was kind of really not the main focus, but they make it seem that way on the covers, um, as we'll look at the covers in, in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, just making it seem in the synopsis, it's like there's this priest and he's, you know. Yeah. If you were to read this the synopsis and look at the cover, to me, when I did, it made me think that this priest is evil and he's he's the one that's doing whatever is going on with Alice. Right. And 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 of course you don't believe that it's that it's the church protecting the world. It's a priest that's it, just like the omen. It's a yeah. sect of priests that are doing something terrible to try and bring the end about. Right. And that, you know, we need to we need to get an eyes on this guy. So it was very interesting. It was almost like a, a double bluff. You know, mm-hmm. they kind of pull us in and we're the whole time we're thinking, well, okay, so the hus- the boyfriend husband's doing is in, in cahoots with the priest and they're going to do something to this girl and all the crazy neighbors are all into it. Um, I thought that was really interesting. The way they, the way that the, he, I mean, they did it. I thought he did a really good job with, um, with, with the, the way he described the interactions between Alice and the, and the neighbors yeah. and how different everybody was and how, you know, how you could picture an apartment building in New York and, you know, certain areas having this just hodgepodge of craziness, you know, mm-hmm. the blind deaf priest and the model and the the lesbian couple that were just excessively sexualized all the time. And yeah. Then the, and then the 80 year old man carrying his cat around with his little bird, you know, mm-hmm. getting in everybody's business. Then the creepy was, old lady. Mm hmm. Mrs. Clark was it? Yeah, Mrs. Clark, and then you had the couple that visited uh, the two um, Obi sisters. Yes. <laughs> yep. The, and uh, and it was just like this. Just it made me think of Caroline, um, the the animated movie based on a Neil Gaiman story. Um, it's like a stop motion, like Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh yeah, Coraline is Coraline, Coraline, and. Uh, it made me think of that when they move into that apartment, that little duplex thing, and they have the neighbors around, and you had the guy with the mice, and the you know it kind of felt had that vibe to it. And I really, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I enjoyed it even more when she goes back to the listing lady and starts complaining about the neighbors to discover that she has no neighbors other than the priest. And I thought yeah. that was a real. That, that's about when I was like, okay, I'm really digging this story. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I was that's like, oh, I really shit. Like, okay, yes. <laughs> now we got something going on. This is totally different than everything else. Because, you know, when you when you put in the inside cover, you start listing, you know, Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, Omen, whatever they put on the others, then you have an idea in your head. And I love that at that point, we were going down a different road. Um, so I, I I did enjoy that aspect. Of it. I enjoyed all of it until the end, and I didn't. And like I said, I really thought the detective character. I as, I assume everybody in the seventies thought they needed a detective character because every one of these <laughs> yeah. books has one. Yep, and they're the all they're all yep. about the same. They're there all is no detective in Rosemary Baby, though. That is true. 
But there was a sort of a, he's not a detective, but he was a historian, the old man that was like her father. Oh yeah, Hutch. And they took, Hutch. yeah, they got rid of Hutch yeah. immediately when he started digging into stuff, mm. which, so we would have had a more detective-like character if he was able to stay around, but they took care of him pretty quick. And yeah. I, and, and, I, and but I'm just saying, and he wouldn't have even been anything like the other ones. The other ones were meddlesome and, um, you know, different variant uh, lengths of of irritation i guess yeah. and every one of these i never i haven't enjoyed any of the detectives in any of these stories yeah i um, want to know what was with gats and the the mouse traps you know what i think that was supposed to be a metaphor was it catching yeah. the rat and the rat yeah. is michael but i think he was so fixated on michael which is why at the end he thought, well, maybe I got this wrong. Maybe I allowed myself to be fixated on the wrong person because of my situation. So that made, you know, so, but yeah, he, that's it was just driving me crazy. Just every, the way he wrote that character was so annoying. And I'm interested because the guy wrote the screenplay is we're doing back to back because the omen was a screenplay book. And now we're going to re, we're going to go get to see, we read the book and now we're going to watch the screenplay, but it's the same guy. They mm -hmm. hired him to do it. So we'll get to see what he either thought didn't work or what the director thought wasn't going to work on screen. And I'm interested to see if he pulls back on some of these characters or if he ramps them up. Yeah. I don't I can't imagine you could ramp Michael up anymore, but I, you know, who knows? I don't know. We'll see. Um I'm interested. I've never seen the movie. So I am very yeah, interested neither. in that. Um yeah, I'm interested to see the scene with um Gertie and the other woman, the yeah, lesbian see, couple. I'm just, it, because it, it, that was just like it went from like zero to 150 in no yeah. time from you know just kind of an awkward thing because she's caught in their apartment and then it turns into like like she's accosting her with like you know her groceries she's trying to yeah, get her no, groceries away the, from her <laughs> was it the, they kept calling the packages i was like yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, all I'm thinking about is, you know, how much of this stuff needs to be refrigerated? You know, and she's just yeah. hanging out with these people making coffee and tea, and <laughs> you got the one girl masturbating, and then the other one just sitting there acting like nothing's going on. Yeah. Until to the point where she does it again, I guess. I mean, I was trying to, the way he described it the second time, you got the, the idea that maybe she was getting off on just holding the other girl's hand yeah but still it did it, it obviously it was supposed to make allison uncomfortable mm -hmm. which which i thought like i said she's a model in the 70s in new york i assume you know you read the stories or hear the stories about studio 54 and the lifestyle these people would be thrust into and i would think this this would be nothing and she was so beside herself oh yeah with, for um, sure and i, I guess that, that kind of goes back to her her catholic upbringing i guess yeah. maybe that's what's supposed to be pushed forward mm. i would have liked to have more background on those ex those characters the the lesbian couple and the clockkin sisters um and you know i just would have liked like we got yeah. a little bit more of of mrs clark because we saw her you know she was this murderer and you know they saw her statue in the wax museum but like we didn't right. get anything like why were the clock and sisters weird like that? And why was, you know, Gertie and the, I forget, I don't know why I can't remember the other girl's name, um, her and her girlfriend. Sandy? Sandy or Sandra, Sandy? Sandra, something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, you know, like, where did they out. come from? Because, you know, like, what's their background? Like, how did they, end I would have liked to have known how these people ended up in that building. Yeah, and, and it makes you wonder, is the building itself, some sort of you know because if they're not alive did they die in the building or, or are their spirits just there because they're waiting to try and get through the gate maybe yeah. and so there because as soon as um at the end as soon as the the guy the main priest guy was gonna put the cross on allison and make allison the sentinel there's a reference to forces beating against the doorway trying to get through to the other side yeah and so I'm wondering if this is like a natural draw to the spirits and that they're drawn to the location because they know that this is the place to get through. So these people are all from hell or in hell or whatever, and they're trying to get, I guess, back to heaven. Is that yeah. the, the point? 
Yeah. Which I wonder if more of this is discussed in The Guardian, which is the second book. Yeah, I have and that. I, and I'm, I'm actually looking forward to reading it. Uh, um, yeah. So that, that right there tells you enough right there. Even if we're not 100% on board with everything, like normal, like anybody would be, it was good enough and intriguing enough to mm. make me want to read the sequel yeah and dive into it and so yeah i think you're right i think if this isn't you know initially it was to talk, can you hear that yeah that is, that is that is totoro because <laughs> it's time for feeding for, for dinner <laughs> for just a snack and they get oh. a snack about this time and she is we're a little late because of the time change she she hits the bowl to make sure you know it's time she does this all the time so i didn't realize this new microphone was going to be able to pick up everything going on in the house so, i'm trying yeah. to look for the name of the the priest that was with um yeah it was oh it, yeah he, it, he had like, a crazy name too because it, it was like uh, like finocci finochin yeah man mancherno he had a weird long last name too and so yeah. and the only it, reason I was looking for that is because so there's the um the hints throughout the book um with the the freckled hands with the white tufts of hair right, right? so so yeah he pops up a number yeah of times, so. but I want to know how did he end up in that church in the Puerto Rican neighborhood at one o'clock in the morning what and it the... happened to be at that church that she goes to to do confession. Right. And then so she felt a longing and a drawing to that church. And it makes me feel like because she's now attached to the house and they're getting her ready to become the guardian or the sentinel, that she will, that, that he knew it. So he must be a part of that process somehow. Yeah. Uh, he must be in a way, I guess, supernatural. Maybe that's something to do with the cross. So I wonder if he lured her there. Mm, after yeah. the thing but at, but you're still right because they went from dinner to the wax museum to a cab that drove around for an hour to her going to this church so it would have to be almost dumb luck that he would be there too unless he was following her or bringing her there yeah uh, but you could tell the cab driver had no clue what was going on he yeah had to take her to a hospital and get her out of the cab um yeah but yeah no i thought the wax museum thing was kind of weird and i get it he, the writer used that as a device to tell us about the character being already dead so that so that it could then it intensifies the boyfriend as a villain because now mm -hmm. we're like well how, he took her there but then it also allows her to share some more of the story of what she's um, envisioning and stuff and didn't you think that was crazy how easily some of the stuff they just took and other stuff they would just draw a line in the sand and say that is not acceptable there's no way this is happening you know, I just mm -hmm. thought that was kind of funny was just yeah. how, you know, they, they really, they didn't really follow any logic that I could see. Yeah. Like you I, said, I mean, you don't, you, you, you said that at the very beginning. I mean, Mike is just all over the place. We mm -hmm. just don't know what we're getting. And it, and it seemed, felt like he was written to justify everyone else's actions and all the, what needed to move the story forward, not what the character itself would be like. Cause right. we're talking and, about a very um, cold, calculating uh intelligent man who's already done terrible things that we don't know mm -hmm. about but right. by the end of the book you do know and by the end of the book he is completely um unraveling he is you know i mean and just everything his reaction to everything is 11 you mm -hmm. know he is, nothing is is normal I, I i cannot get his is the interaction he had with jennifer when he's trying to tell her best friend what's going on her reaction is totally normal we need to call the police we need he's to do like, these other things and he is so and i understand why he's adamant we can't talk to the police because they can't learn about these other things but i mean just his reaction alone would be enough to scare a normal person into calling the police right and you know i liked how um he kind of the author kind of put it in your head that maybe him and jennifer were having an affair because there's that yeah. one scene and i think in the hospital where she's like oh she's in the bathroom doing obscene things or whatever um and then just like um 
the little hints of oh they smiled at each other you know yeah, you know what you're right because the, the and that would i guess you know what and that should have made me not not think of it as so the, how aggressive and violent he is towards her when she mentions the, the the dead wife he grips her by the hair he pulls her hair his her head back you know like like he's about to punch her in the throat or something you know what i mean mm -hmm. and she doesn't even bat an eye about that and then so now if we're thinking well you're right if they're in a relationship she well she does kind of mention i knew you had a violent streak or something yeah at that point but yeah and, and she see and she mentions that she knows more about what happened to karen than right you know she said something like i know what really happened or something along those lines which makes you wonder i mean because did they ever go into detail how she died they just kept saying she died did yeah they they just said it pills? was I'm pills wondering if, i think it, it must have been pills because there was a point when allison takes a pill and it sticks and then she gets kind of panicky and yeah. i think she makes reference to the to the dead wife um yeah, overall, I, I I enjoyed it. I don't want to nitpick the heck out of this one, but there were a couple things, like I said. But it definitely makes me want to read the next one because I want to see if he expands on the doorway, the room. Yeah. Are happens? we going to actually get more idea about Allison? Because, I mean, the book ends. They've already torn the brownstone down and rebuilt another um, apartment complex. Mm -hmm. And she's in that apartment complex. So I'm a little confused as to how that happens, how that happens when you have a door to hell or heaven, yeah. whatever you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that, that's a little strange. And yeah. so I, what I envisioned was going to happen was that that, was that couple moves into the apartment and across the street is the brownstone, one lone brownstone, you know, the one building and everything else is being modernized and that she would be in that building. But I thought it was odd that she was actually in the new apartment. Um, and they had more people than just the couple living there. So it's not just like it was in the, in when she moves into the brownstone, uh, yeah. where it's just her and the priest, although she does think there's more people. So now, um, now I guess, do we have to think, is that couple, are they ghosts? Are they, are they actual people? Is this really happening? Are they the next in line? Of course. Yeah. Or the baby, cause she's pregnant. The wife yeah. is pregnant. So, and then you got to think the priest was there for because well, it's written in the seventies. So you think what thirty years, twenty five years? Wasn't like fifty something to seventy something? Yeah. That he's the sentinel, and so now, so how long is she the sentinel? You know, do they have a time limit, and then they have to have a new person, or can she be it for a long time? You know, I'm just curious. I and hopefully they'll they'll answer those questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I like I liked how the author. Um, subtly was saying the changes like the physical changes with allison like her skin being dry um, yeah. and her eyes drying out um because they mentioned that her eyes the doctor said something about her eyes being desiccated which doesn't make any sense because if your eyes desiccated you can't see but she was clearly able to still see but it made sense at the end because they changed they decay enough mm -hmm. to be not recognizable as who they are really um you ever seen that movie with uh kate kate hudson it's a zombie movie skeleton key yes have you seen that mm -hmm. it kind of made me think of that but it said it's not the same because it's spoiler alert if you haven't seen skeleton key mute us or whatever for a few minutes i'll raise my hand when we're done but you know <laughs> they they the old people are actually the people that just keep they just keep putting themselves in younger bodies, and then they age, and then they put themselves in a younger body. It made me think of that, except for this person aged, and then they're still just trapped in the body. Yeah. But then it, uh, I'm also curious: is it the cross that stops people, the demons, from going, you know, through the gate, or is it the entity of the person itself there? Yeah. Like, are they like in the doorway kind of thing? And that's why they have to sit in the same location, the same spot. Which makes me wonder: how did they build an entire building around this one spot? And the one spot isn't on the ground floor. It's on the fourth floor or fifth floor. Yeah. So and in the new also, building, it's on the 20th floor. Yeah. So how does that work? But those are all things that only people that are going to nitpick are going to worry about. Overall, yeah. I thought the book was well written. Yeah. Uh, I, did I enjoyed it a, a lot. Few, 
few too many explanation points, but that seemed to be mm -hmm. a thing in the 70s. They really seemed to like the explanation points. Exclamation points, yeah. And this guy was big into adverbs, which I don't have a problem with. But <laughs> I could I was I kept thinking, well, Stephen King went like this. Yeah. So, here we have the this is I think the cover that classic, right? Yeah. Um mine is the same, but it has the little blurb here about it being a movie. Um but it's basically the same, the keyhole. Um, yeah, I have the uh, the same one except for my second cover part fell out when the cat attacked the book. So, so I don't, I have it somewhere in the house, but I don't know where. <laughs> yeah, this one's falling apart. I got it on thrift books. It used to belong to a Melissa Schwartz. <laughs> that's cool. All your books always have the signature. I think that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So. I really yeah. like the cover. In fact, I'll be honest, this cover sold this book to me when I bought it like four or five years ago when I was at Half Price Bookstore. I saw this cover. I had no idea what it was, which is crazy because I've seen the, the Burbs a number of times and didn't recognize that they spoke about this book until just a couple of weeks ago when I watched it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I saw this cover and I thought this looks really cool. And then I saw, you know, the name drops and stuff. And I thought I'd give it a shot. So yeah. Definitely. Same thing when I was looking up this book. Um, and I have to make sure to mention um, thanks to Tim Eagle for the suggestion. Um, oh, yeah. Because yeah, he's definitely. the one that suggested this book. Um, and it perfectly lined in to what we were doing. It was like, yeah. it, was a, it was a wonderful way to cap this little group of 70s supernatural horror that we were doing. Yeah. And so after we decided we were going to do it, I went on thrift books and I was like, holy crap, I love that cover. Yeah. Um, now here's another one. I think this might be the cover to the audio book. Oh, okay. But I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, I only found four covers to begin with. But I, if I saw this, I'd be like, oh, this looks really cool. Yeah. Then I would have been mad. Because this, yeah. like you said, they don't really discuss any of this stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, the priest. This one I, I think is very eye-catching. I do too. Um, I really like this cover. And, and I would have probably picked the book up with this cover just as easily as the first one yeah and in fact i i think i might like this one the most there's just something about it just yeah. the way they did it. it it's just really cool yeah and i think it's more appropriate because the main focus is allison um so you know yeah. with the the woman on the cover i think it, it's, it's but it, it is it's very eye-catching i would definitely pick this book up would be like holy crap this just looks like it'll be a good book and i think i'm going to start telling people i write sophisticated terror because i think that's pretty funny too <laughs> yeah sophisticated yeah. terror <laughs> that's what i do <laughs> and they're like no we read your stuff i don't know if it's sophisticated yeah. but i thought this was an interesting cover too i think this yeah. might be um uh, like a European cover or mm. like a UK cover. Um, Cause I saw it, I saw this exact same cover with everything in a different language too. So oh, really? I was thinking that maybe this was, was that thing, but I think this is really cool. And yeah. this is just as, I mean, this is, it's not like you said, they don't talk about the priest enough, but when they do a lot of times, it's just him staring out that window. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really cool way of doing it. I, I, you know what? For once, I didn't see a cover that made me say I wouldn't have looked at the book again. You know, we yeah. always seem to have one or two covers that fall flat, but these covers have all been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, all the, they have great covers. Um, but I, I'm just going to honestly say that I think this is my favorite. I do, I, yeah, I'm with you. I'm, uh, I, like, I like die cut covers, and this one's really cool. Yeah. When you open it up, you got all the extra stuff and the characters and things. But yeah, no, this right here, I think does a much better job of giving you an idea of kind of what you're getting into than the other one does. Yeah. I mean, and even, she even looks like a model with like the, the, mm -hmm. the makeup um, on her eyes. And I'm kind of mad that I didn't get this cover. <laughs> um, I mean, I do like the keyhole cover with the priest on it, but I didn't even see an option to be able to get this cover. Yeah. Um, I don't even, yeah. I'll have to do some, we'll have to research. I don't even know what, what that was from you know this may be like um a, a different uh, a different paperback year. or something or it's probably from the 80s it has a little bit of an 80 vibe to yeah it. yeah it kind of does like a little bit of xanadu makeup looking right mm -hmm. here now that yeah. you say that yeah because this one is 1974 so let's see i think mine is for some reason i was thinking mine was 70 oh no 74 i was thinking it was 79 
but so 74, we wouldn't have had, yeah, we would have had Amityville as an influence, but yeah. you definitely can see how they got Rosemary's Baby and Exorcist. And I guess we need to check out the others at some point, but we have already come to the end of our yeah. um, Supernatural 70s horror. So, but yeah, no, I'm with you 100%. I love, this is my favorite cover. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the book, and I'm ex I mean, I'm excited to see the movie. I want to. I am too. It. I really am. I want to see how they do all the the characters. I want to see, oh. and not not necessarily. Um, I'm looking forward to the like crazy characters, the yeah. Clonet sisters and Mrs. Clark, and how crazy are they going to ramp it up? Is what I yeah. want to see. I'm I just really, really hope they don't have the lady who played on rosemary's baby as the neighbor <laughs> that would be hilarious because that uh, woman i don't yeah. know her just her voice just annoyed yeah. me and she was totally not what i envisioned for that character 100 percent Okay, so we're doing the Not Stephen King Book of the Week, and this week I have picked, oh, let's see if I can get over there, Berserk. I'm going to, I'm just going to totally kill his name. It is Kentara Miura, I think. I don't know. Link will be below, so just go ahead and do that. This is my favorite um, manga, and it is filled with monsters and violence and swords and magic and everything you could think of. Um, and it's it's dialed up to 11 and the story follows this main guy guts and he uh he's a mercenary for hire and he gets hooked up with some people that have uh, a leader who is basically trying to become the master of everything and so initially you think he's just trying to become the king of these places but it turns out that he's looking to become more like a god and so there's just all of these crazy um, curses and monsters, and it's just filled with over-the-top violence. And, and um, there's a couple movies that have been done that you can see on Netflix uh, that cover the main storyline, uh, which is probably books like, I want to say books 7 through 15. So it kind of goes back and kind of talks about some of the stuff that you'll find out why he's the way he is. But the book starts off. And he's basically cursed, and every night the curse draws evil spirits to him. And oh. they also possess people, and they make them do terrible things. And so his whole thing is going through life with this burden as he's trying to um, protect his one true love. And so there's elves and just a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And uh, there's like 40 or 50 books out. Oh, and actually, <laughs> I have this right now, like here, to show you all in this, but I prefer to read it on the Kindle because they have the swipe system and it's already the right way and everything. And and I've enjoyed it because you can focus in on the panels and pull them up bigger and all that stuff. So a lot of times you'll go to Comicology and they'll have be on sale. You can get them for five bucks a pop, uh, sometimes even cheaper than that. So if you, uh, if you like it manga and you like to have some pretty cool stuff let's see we got some of the art here yeah, like that's kind of a cool oh wow cool. yeah that's yeah. pretty neat so anyways i would suggest it i know i bet you brad would like this if he isn't already reading it i'm sure he's already got this probably <laughs> he probably has the hardcover collector books and all that stuff mm -hmm. but i would suggest getting it however you can and checking it out but i really enjoy reading them on the kindle and then just pulling them up, you know, one at a time. So uh, that is it, I guess. And next week, we are going to tackle the movie. Or the next time we come together, I guess in two yep. weeks, we'll tackle the movie. And discuss what they did right and what they might have done better or worse. And, and man, I hope they cast this correctly. Because I, I, I am a little worried about who they're going to pick for some of these parts. Because we're we are talking late 70s when they probably did the movie. Yeah, so, I haven't even, like, Googled the movie to see who the cast is. I want it to be a complete surprise when I yeah, pull it up the, and start watching it. 100%. I'm the same way with this one. So I want to see. I want to be uh, surprised. Yeah. I just, I'm like, fingers crossed. I hope it's good because I enjoyed the book. And I think it has so much potential um, to be a great movie. 
Yeah, so. especially because it's not a blood and guts kind of movie. This is a no. real suspenseful kind of thing, and I want to see if they handled it correctly. Yeah, and so it's sophisticated. That's right. Sophisticated, sophisticated terror. terror. That is awesome. <laughs> Got to get that on a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, the link to the book of the week um, will be down in the description and we'll see you on the next episode. Take it easy.